travel, on foreign travel, my daughter sends me with a little plush toy and I take pictures of tiny monster in front of famous things. So he's helping me with my presentation today. Yes, I have a good father deal with it. Uh, hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for coming. Thanks for coming over here at National Travel Track. Uh, uh, hopefully it will meet your expectations. Uh, my name is Alan C. Smith. Uh, obviously I'm an architect because I'm here, uh, but I'm also a certified event developer, test stand developer, uh, professional instructor, Latin champion. People talk about me getting all the certs, but I don't actually want to see the I cert. Uh, right, I've been code for 24 years now. It's kind of a long time. Uh, I'm currently uh, operating as a consulting architect, uh, not on my own. I have been an alliance partner in the past. I have worked for alliance partners. I did a six-year stint at NI, where I got to be on the Active Framework team. Am I still on the Active Framework team? Yeah, yeah, I'm still on the Active Framework team. I was on the Active Framework team before I went to NI, and I'm still on the Active Framework team. So that's actually really, really cool, I have to say. Um, and uh, uh, I wrote all the tools, all the products and tools for Active Framework. I wrote the course on Active Framework, and I still actively teach that, and it's the CPI. I'm still very involved in AF. Now that I'm back to consulting and working on a contract basis, I'm using AF a lot in my own work. This presentation on efficient active framework development, structure and messaging, actually comes from some of my experiences over the last year or so of actually being out in the field and working on larger applications with AF and seeing some of the some of the, the places where there's a little friction. Um, when we're writing AF systems, boy, we write a lot of code, don't we? How many are using AF? Oh, good. <laughs> this is why I had to come to Europe, so you're right. Um, we write a lot of code, don't we? I mean, we write some acronyms, we write some, some, some uh, methods for them, and then we write a whole bunch of message classes. And, and most of what we write is these, most of the code effects on this are these message classes, and we can mostly ignore them because they're glue code. They're, they're there to make it work, but they're not actually part of our design. Um, the, the artifacts go up as we use abstract messages. You're all using abstract messages, right? Okay, they're really, really important for having properly decoupled code uh, and properly testable code. So um, if you're not using them, please start. But you get more code artifacts. And, and we make it easy to get those code artifacts. We have a lot of tools that make it easy to write this glue code so you don't have to think about it very much. But that creates its own moral hazard because we get more of the things we subsidize. It's really easy to write a message, you don't think about writing another message. And so I have seen over the last you know, couple of years that we do get this proliferation of, of message classes. And that can start to be a problem with lots and lots of message classes and the API starts to get burdened down. It can be a problem trying to navigate the flow through your system, especially for new developers or guys that are fresh on your team. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the things. This is a tactical kind of presentation, tips and tricks. Not a lot of deep theory. Um, but I'm going to present some ideas that I have on ways to lighten the burden of dealing with the messages. The messages themselves are fine. Active framework is plenty performant. Having a lot of message classes doesn't, doesn't mess up your code and runtime, but it can make you a little less efficient in terms of your user experience and just, just working with, with your own code base. So I'm going to cover a couple areas. I'm going to talk about decluttering our actors themselves, what we can do to make them a little lighter weight. And then I want to take another look, another pass at zero coupling and abstract messages. And are there some things we can do there to make that a bit more manageable? Okay. <clears throat> so, cluttering actors, let's start there. We'll start with the actor itself. Uh, an important step in understanding how to be efficient in designing and building your actors is to understand the framework itself thoroughly. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to really understand it thoroughly to get started. But if you want to be really efficient, it helps to really understand how actors live and die, and how they, they operate while they're, they're how they come to be, how they operate, and then how they go away. Um, when you log, run an actor, obviously an actor is it's it's just a lab class. It's running a context and a process. Um, in a very real sense, it is just the internal data cluster of a queue message handler, right? Um, obviously, it's more than that. But that's kind of the core of what it is. Um, and so understanding how, so when you run, when you launch an actor, what you're actually doing is you're running this VI called actor.vi. And actor.vi does some housekeeping stuff that, that you don't need to worry about having to do with, with queue management. 
And then it also has this flow, this lifecycle flow. When you, the first thing that happens is pre launch and it gets running. And of course, we do some setup um, in, that, in that space. Um, <coughs> launch actor waits for pre launch to finish, which is an important thing to understand. Uh, if pre launch and it fails, launch actor returns an error message. If pre launch and it succeeds, launch actor returns, and the actor continues to run. Uh, we get message handling in actor core, of course. Uh, when message handling stops, either through instruction or error, then we run stop core. And we also return um, a last act to our caller. Is this familiar to pretty much everybody here? Or should be at this point if you're using actor framework, hopefully? Okay, cool. This is, this is, a, this is a refresher just to kind of uh, focus you on a couple things to be thinking about for the first half of this presentation. Um, Everything here is a dynamic dispatch BI, except for send last act, which invokes a dynamic dispatch BI. So these are all your touch points. We have a few more inside of Actor Core, where you know that's, that's like the first thing that people get really familiar with is, is Actor Core. That's where the message handling happens. Um, you know, we'll we'll pop a message off of our off of our queue. <coughs> we'll handle it and receive a message on the BI. If it generates an error, we handle that and handle error. And then of course we can stop and run stop and stop core. All three of these will stop before the handle error and receive message are again overrides. You can change them. This is how we make actors do what we to do. <laughs> so, as I said, I teach actor framework, I teach actor oriented design on that. And a little over a year ago, I was teaching a class and I had a request from the students. They were struggling to understand this well. And they wanted Hello World. Okay, Hello World and actor framework. Like, what does that look like? Right? Okay, Hello World is a single VI. An actor framework is going to be so much more than that. So I got to think, all right, what he really wants to see is he wants to see message flow and he wants to see how these things come into being and go away. I can do that. And I set myself a little challenge. I said, all right, it's got to be a two actor system because a single actor by itself is totally uninteresting. And I want to do this with the minimum set possible. It's kind of like that old game show, name that too. I can solve this problem with five messages. Well, I can solve this problem with three messages. Okay? And what I finally settled on, didn't take very long, one method, hello world, one message to invoke hello world, and override of actor core, because we have to launch something, and an override of handle last act core. Okay, for just hello world, it points up being only, you wouldn't use actor framework if this is all you had to do, but that's what we got. So, going into detail, you know, our sender um, actor in its actor core is going to launch the receiver, which is the thing that's going to announce hello world. It's going to send the hello world message right away. You can do that as soon as it has the cure. When the receiver gets that message, of course, that invokes the hello world BI. We get our single, our one button dialogue that says hello Broadway. These are actors, after all, and if you're an actor, Broadway's the whole world. Um, there's this thing on that, <laughs> And then, and, then, and then, the other thing that I wanted to have happened was I wanted this whole thing, as soon as the dialog box cleared, to stop. And so I did that with error 43. Has anybody looked inside the do.vi for the stop message? A couple of people, I point this out in class. There's, there's not a lot there. It doesn't invoke a method of the actor. It simply pushes an error code out onto the error wire, which you should probably think of as a stop wire with like, conditions of why you stopped. It's a better way to think about it. So that's all it does. There's no method call. Just push out an error 43. Well, you can do that too. If your method calculates that the actor should stop, you don't have to send yourself a message. You can choose to do so, which will guarantee they will handle all the messages that are in your queue. But you don't have to. If you want to stop right away, that's usually the case when you calculate to stop. Just send yourself an error 43. Total aside, um, if you need to make a message that all of your actors in your system can operate on, you can do this. You're not required to invoke a method of an actor, of a specific actor, you can do. You can make your own custom message classes as soon as you want. Um, Report error does this. Uh, there's another. Um, the big message called register actor that the DTT system uses, the, the DO trace system uses. 
Um, I, I'm going to try a few experiments with malleable VIs on actors and see if I can make some fun things happen there. <laughs> that was my thought from this morning. Um, anyway, so you can do that. You can totally do this, and it's totally awesome doing that. Um, so, last thing we need. So now we've got, we've launched our Hello World actor. We've invoked the Hello World message. The, the, the receiver actor has shut down. And now we need to stop the caller, of course. Well, that happens where? In the last act court. That's where we know that, that's where we learn that an actor has stopped. Um, sender knows it has exactly one nested, and it knows that when that nested is, is done, that it should also stop. So we just send this all in error 43 again. Okay, this is a trivial example. It's Hello World in Actor Framework. Um, not a lot of learning here unless you haven't seen this before. But it's a nice setup for thinking about that, what's the minimum set for these things that we need to do? Let me give you another sample example of something that we need to do. A lot of people want to do an orderly shutdown. Normally in actor framework, the, the, the fault behavior is you say, hey, I'm going to drop my pointer. And then you pick up your pointer and you say, you know, I, would, I, I want my top level actor to stop. It will tell us nested to stop and so on and so on. Orderly shutdown goes the other way. I need A and B to stop before C can stop, for whatever reason. Usually it's safe stating. Um, so A and B need to stop, and then I can stop C. Okay, how do I do that? Again, question to ask, what's the minimum set? Well, I can't answer that unless I know what I need. What do I have to have? Well, I've got to be able to launch to stop my missed actors. That happens in actor core most likely. Um, I'm just going to generate my list of nested actors and I'm going to hold on to that list of incurers. You're probably already doing this. I need an all stop method of some kind. I need a way to say, hey, all my nested actors need to stop. And oh, by the way, I'm going to set a flag that says that I am now in a stopping state. So that'll change how I handle and respond to other messages. Um, I need to track my shutdown process. Okay. I'm already picking up a little bit of efficiency because I can use my error 43 again. And what I do is I say, if I'm stopping, I'm going to set actor count to zero, then I can stop. If my nested actor count is zero, I need to pull an actor out of my out of my list and then go on with that. So eventually I'll get to zero actors, hopefully, and I can stop. Um, now, how many of you know about this little trick here? How many of you use this? You know, this is um, last act returns the cure of a nested actor. How many of you do that? Just a couple of hands. Any of you wondering why? This is why. Okay. Last act returns the cure. It's dead. It doesn't do anything. You can't send messages. But an cure in actor framework wraps four Latin keys, which of course are represented as four numbers, which are guaranteed to be unique for this one of LabVIEW, which means your cure is unique, which means it's a fingerprint, which means you can use it as the unique ID for the actor that just stopped, and you don't have to add custom identifiers. How many of you have had to go, um, I need, I need an identifier, so I'm gonna put a quid and a string inside of my actor? You don't need to do that, don't do that. You have one. So, um, we can, that's, that's, that is what, you know, this over at the level is about. Okay, um, I have one last piece that I need. And this is the piece that actually gives me a little bit of heartburn. I need a shutdown message. I need a special message to my actor to do an orderly shutdown. I don't think this is terribly actor like because we have a way to stop actors. We tell them to stop. And in fact, this doesn't make stop go away. So somebody can come along and send a stop to my actor and blow right past my orderly shutdown. Maybe you want that. I'm not here to judge. Um, but, uh, but, but that doesn't seem right to me. If I put an early shutdown, I want that to be the way I shut down. What I need is a way to override my stop behavior. Well, we've seen that there's no stop the I invoked by the message. What happens in the stop message? What do we do? We push an error out of the error wire. Okay, where do we handle errors? Handle error. So I can, if I want to change the stop behavior of an actor, 
I go into handle error and I override it and I change what I know in response to an error of 43. You can get yourself in trouble doing this, so be aware of what you're doing. But this is what you can do. So I replaced it, my, my shutdown with a stop nested. I wanted to call it something different to reflect a slightly different behavior. Um, and that's, it does exactly what, what the shutdown BI does. Um, and then I check my auto stop nested actor count. And if my nested actor count is zero, I go ahead and stop. If not, I don't stop the actor. Now, who all has seen this? Read auto stop nested actor count. I see zero hands in this room. I expect a couple at least. We got that one in 2016, Stephen? <coughs> Yeah, 2016 we got that. And it was a part of something we got in 2014, which is auto stop. There is an optional input to um, launch root does it too, doesn't it? I mean, launch nested for sure does it. If auto stop is true and that's the default behavior, that impure automatically gets put on a list that's held internal to the actor base class that you have no access to as you can't use too much. And, and, and when you go to stop, the stop functionality that's built in sends that broadcast stop for you. Okay, so you don't have to do this anymore. I see a question for me on your face. No, I, I just, I, you know, using the actor framework before and then like having it eventually developed into that, I think it added confusion because, you know, sometimes you can choose, before you used to have launch actor and then yeah. you have the launch root or launch nested and, you know, do you keep the act, the, the wire, you know, because yeah. when you do the launch nested, then you have to keep that wire, right? Otherwise, yeah. If you want to talk to your actor, you have to keep its address. It's, that's that's a failure. Right. I, I mean, I think people were doing. I think doing it outside of that, which may be more evident to me. Um, I, my understanding, and, and I guess we have to take this question offline because I'm a little time constrained. But if you check with Stephen, my understanding is that there was actually a great deal of confusion when we just had launch actor because of some requirements we're putting in the keyword in, and going to launch and launch nested made that a lot better for a lot of people. And I've, I've been, I, I was originally like, why did we do that? That's kind of cute. But I've been my piece with it. I actually think it's clean this way. Um, anyway, going back to, to why I bring this up is, you know, auto stop is true. You don't have to do this anymore. You can't if you want. You might have some actors that you don't auto stop. But if you're all your actors that auto stop, you don't have to specifically do this in stop. Now, we still have to have it for our quarterly shutdown behavior because we don't have access to that queue. Um, I would love it if I had a single VI. Yes, yeah, I've already asked for Steve, and he's already told me no, but I'm hoping that we can start a conversation and, and maybe get there. Right, a single VI that was like stop, you know, you know trigger auto stop. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that exposes too much, but I think there's room for discussion on the topic, so I'm not going to push forward too hard. Anyway, know your framework, save yourself steps. So, my, I can go back and now I can do my handle last stack core again. And then get rid of all of that um, in place on the structure stuff that I had in the beginning. Because I don't need to do that because that count is kept for me automatically. I can just check to see how many SF actors do I still have. Minimum set. So here is my orderly shutdown solution. And, and maybe some of you guys have a better one, but um, I think this is pretty clean. <clears throat> one method, which as I've said, I'd love to see if I actually have that. Uh, one, override the handle error to change my stop behavior. One, handle last tab core to complete the shutdown behavior. That's it. That's, that's pretty clean. Okay. I like that. Um, all right, so moving on to another example, another opportunity for efficiency if we follow our framework. Um, something I've taken to calling ephemeral versus persistent actors. Um, we have this notion, a number of people have a notion, and I did for the longest time, that your nested had to run for the entire span of the application. Now, we would make an exception for the UI, but we wouldn't follow that through this logical conclusion, which is that some of our actors should come and go. Possibly most of them, depending on the system. Here's an example of a persistent actor, one that sticks around. Uh, this is Link Network Actor, which I released as a community release in 2012 around the time of the official release of Actor Framework because I knew we would need to be able to talk from target to target to target to target. And that's what Leap Net Network Actor does. It wraps up network streams so you can have this communication. And I made it persistent because I was naive in 2012 and 
thought I'd have to be there for the whole time. And what I bought myself was extra messages. Because if a connection actor has to be there all the time, you have to tell it to connect, and you have to tell it to disconnect. And that's messages. But if I change my perspective and I say to myself, self, um, this actor is going to connect when it launches and it's going to disconnect and it stops. Connect goes away because I do it before I start handing the messages. Disconnect goes away because it's just a part of my shutdown process. Okay? I also was able to get rid of transmit network message, which was this clunky thing that I had, that I had to have. Um, and I got rid of it with an override and received message. That's outside the scope of this talk. Catch me offline if you want to know what I did there. Um, or other presentations I've done. Um, so that left me with this. That left me with the nested endpoint, which is an ephemeral actor. It takes no messages. All it does is send it a message that forwards across the wire. Doesn't get more efficient than that. I did keep one abstract message to color, uh, which is my connected message. So when, when this thing connects, it tells its caller that it is connected. If I had chosen to do my connect in pre launch and hit, I wouldn't need this because my caller would wait on, pre -launch, on launch actor until pre launch init happened. If I didn't connect, that would be an error and I would know right away. If I cleared from launch actor with no error, I knew I could send messages. I chose to keep the connected message for some functional advantages, which is your connect might have a 60 second time. And I don't want my caller to wait that long. But that's a choice on my end. And there may be other situations where your ephemeral actor can start right away. You don't need that behavior. OK. Something that I've seen people do in their ephemeral actors is they go, all right, I'm launching a lengthy calculation. I'm going to run it at an actor so it's a parallel process. And it's going to do my long bit of math. And then I'm going to send myself that answer to make myself stop. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to send a message to my caller saying, here's the answer, and then I'm going to stop. Please don't do that. You get the final state of the actor back in, in last act. You get the actor cube. You can launch it again if you wanted to. It has every piece of data that that actor has. So your minimum set for return message set for returning data from an ephemeral actor is no messages, zero messages. Okay. Um, zero new messages. So here it is. You know, this is I run an actor. I have a process. The process takes some time. It finishes. I send myself a stop saying I'm finished. I do have to do that. Um, but that's a, that's a message that's provided. And then I bundle my data into the actor and I send it back. And then I just unpack it and call her in a handle last act Just send a stop. Bundle your data on return. Zero new messages. Okay? Understand how the framework works. Look for those opportunities in your overrides or where the actor's already going to do it and save yourself some messages and make the actor as thin as you can make it. Okay? Uh, Sam? Question. In that case, why do you send yourself a stop as a Because I, because this is running as a, this is, this is actor, this is, uh, uh, Caller's actor core and it's message handling, and oh, it won't exit. Yeah. yeah, I have to do that. I have to trigger it somehow. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but it's not a new message. Nope. It's one that exists in the framework. Okay, um, so let's turn attention to zero coupling and the oversized load that it often is. Um, <clears throat> we're going to step outside of our actors. We looked at making the actor better. So let's look outside and let's look at our system and how our actors relate to each other, and specifically zero coupling and see what we can do to lighten the load there. And this is going to the system view. So here is a small actor system. Actors A, B, C, and D in our set of relationships. And everybody sends messages up to their caller. And that's two message classes each. Okay. Um, so abstract messages, I walked over there. If you have a load, stop that. Sorry, I realized I couldn't see my notes. All right, here we go. Um, yeah, so 
This is what's going on in a typical abstract messaging arrangement. I have two actors nested in color. Um, Nest defines an API with three abstract message classes uh, with different data in them and the promises that Nested will send these messages at some point. Um, caller who wants to use Nested um, needs to make concrete child messages of the messages that it wants to receive. If you don't want to receive a message, it turns out it doesn't actually hurt anything if you don't make it out of child. You just get an abstract message that doesn't do anything. But still, you know, we make these three messages. That is six scripting operations. You can't go, here are my, here are my three things, right click and make a bunch of them like you can for standard messages. And worse, each of these scripting operations, and it's the reason why you have to do them more at a time, has some things you have to do. So an abstract is, you know, right click on the actor, create abstract message, get a dialog box, put some controls on, down on the dialog box, create message. And then the nest, the caller has to go back and has to say, all right, I want to make a concrete child. I right click on a method, concrete child, go find that on disk. Okay, kind of fiddly. Necessary for proper decoupling, but fiddly. Kind of detracts from your user experience. So what can we do? Well, take a look at your system. In your system, you will likely find that you have several abstract message types that send the same data. Okay? You know, a string, a double, you know, an array of doubles, a waveform. Okay? You'll have some that are very specific to the specific actor, and that's what it is. But you're going to find opportunities where you can share these message classes around. Well, heck, the most common one, I think, is a simple trigger that's not data at all. Man, I get tired of writing that one. Well, the tools, and I have to apologize for doing this, okay? the tools say, well, nested three, you know, nested three has to send this lap view object, and so I have to make the abstract specifically for nested three, so I get all the goodies that I'm supposed to get with that. Um, that's what the tools say, and a lot of the time it's okay, but it's not necessary. We can take these abstract messages out of their actor libraries, have them be standalone, or group them into a, a message API library of the common types that we share, and then share them just as if they were in the class. Okay, they're message types, they're not specific messages. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that there might be an advantage to actually making those individual abstract messages for your callers, because that does buy you some very strict typing. Okay, and then they be useful for you. So as all things, there's trade-offs. Consider if this is going to be valuable and more valuable to have it instead of strict typing. Uh, Sam, you have a question? So I was going to say, so if you have two nested actors and different actors, they're both sending you data. The same kind of data. How do you know which one it came from? Well, it's it's so this is this is this is a um, you register, you just register for different So nested so our three nested up here. Have, they still have as, um, you know, in their private class data, they still have these as attributes, mm -hmm. the individual ones as attributes. So to a different uh, concrete class and different Yeah, okay. that's before. Nothing has changed on the, on the color level. Okay. But instead of, instead of, I've got a message that is just a trigger sitting in my library, I'm going to use, a, I'm going to use as my type a message that's sitting in a different library. Yeah. That's all. Now, it would be terribly handy if I could make this message library I can throw it in a library, right click, and create an abstract message for this library. Um, it would not be difficult to do. I, I was thinking about doing it, I didn't get a chance to do it before I left, and I kind of a bummer. But in the meantime, here's an idea that I have that I'm going to try out, uh, which is uh, if you want to get into the tooling easily, make a dummy actor, put it in a library. <laughs> You're never going to use it, but what it'll do is it'll give you a hook into the tools. So you can still easily use the tools to make your uh, abstracts. Um, I'd love to see the tools evolve. Don't know if we'll have a chance to do it. In the meantime, this might be a good workaround for you. OK. Um, going back to our message types, you will find often, one sec, you will often find that you have a message type that sends no data. It's just a basic trigger. It's a simple announcement of some 
change of status, <clears throat> and you hope somebody does something intelligent in response. Well, I've written a bunch of these. I'm sure you've written a bunch of these. I'm tired of writing these. I don't have to write these. We have a self-address message. How many have used a self-address message for something? A few more hands. These are pretty cool. On my last project, we used these for trigger messages a lot, and it turned out to be simpler. The abstract, the self-address message, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, <clears throat> is just a, um, it's a, it's a way to give an actor a predefined message to send to a predefined destination. Okay? And the actor doesn't know anything about the message, just that it's kicking it off. So you get one by calling address message, you give it a destination and cure and a message class, and possibly a priority, and now you've got a little package that you can give to the actor. When that actor wants to send the message, he calls send self address message. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and what send self address message does is it just puts the message on the cure that it's supposed to. But the call, the actor that sends it does it has no knowledge that this is happening. This is an example of a proxy. <coughs> in the last couple of years, has become one of my favorite things in using actor systems. A proxy is just a placeholder for another object. In this case, it's a protection proxy. I'm going to give you an object, but I'm going to control how you can use it. I'm going to limit the things that you can do. The object I'm controlling in this case is the recipients in cure, okay? which is a very handy thing to be able to do. So if I have that, I can take this arrangement, where messages one, types 1, 2, and 3 are just triggers, and I can make it this. No, I get rid of three message classes, just gone. Okay? The, um, my nested just has three self address messages that it's going to send when its three trigger events happen. The beautiful thing is the caller still has to make three messages, but they're normal messages. They are not children of an abstract parent. Okay? So it's a really, really handy thing. Um, getting away from strict typing, understand what you're doing, understand if that cost has any, any actual specific implications for you. It may not. It has, it is, it's not going to hurt you, then. don't worry about it. But just be aware. OK, going back and looking at our hierarchy again. Um, talking across the tree, I have this conversation all the time. And I have shared the frustration of this. I need a piece of data from A to get to actor C. Okay. And what that means, if you're adhering to the tree, is my abstract message from A to D, a concrete message at D that invokes a forwarding method, which just calls a, me a message of C. <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a full. And uh, invokes a target method on C. And after you do this three or four times, you get really, really tired of routing stuff across the top. Now, there's no reason, no performance reason, no, no application reason not to run it through D. It's just fine performance-wise. You're talking about a few milliseconds extra, and you would hit it keeps you on the tree hierarchy, which is a good thing. You do enough of these, though, you start to go, my user experience kind of sucks. I wonder if I can bring this up. <clears throat> At some point, you will find where you really, really, really want to do this. I just want to send from A to C directly. And there are times it's OK. Before I get into one of those times, though, I need to give you the obligatory safety warnings. OK? Uh, <laughs> uh, you are, you get certain protections from being on the tree. And if you, when, you, when you decide to come off the tree, you forfeit those. OK? At least we're going to do it. So some things that might become a problem. Your cues are not protected. A has to have C's Q. That gives A all sorts of opportunities for mischief. I'm going to send you a stop. Oh, so yeah. Anyway, um, that's bad. <clears throat> you're breaking down your encapsulation abstraction, and you're you're, under, you're increasing coupling because A has to know about C. You're likely using an abstract message, which means that C depends on A's library. Okay. Um, you're going to find that you can't use these two actors apart from each other, or, or from something comparable. <coughs> um, you can also run into interesting data synchronization issues. If I'm sending data to my peers, 
and my peers then send data to color, I can't ever synchronize those because these are app asynchronous processes, which is what we like. So lots of, you can get yourself in trouble stepping off the tree. And there are times to do it. This is a popular one. You know, actor A is a publisher of data. My publisher of data is controlling some monolithic piece of hardware, perhaps, like a mod bus, and they've got one pipe in and out for all the data off its system. And I've got to share that data to B and C. If I stuck to the tree, then I would be sending all that information from A out to B, and D would be responsible for parsing it out to my different actors. If I have a lot of publishers and a lot of subscribers, and my subscribers come and go, D is going to turn into a beast. Okay? It's going to be hard to understand a lot of stuff going on. So people want to push that down into individual publishers. So at least you own that, at least, at least it's one publisher for subscribers. Um, <clears throat> but D is now, or A is now tracking the cures from all these other guys and all the messages it has to send. And so A can get complex. We'd like to do something about this. Um, <clears throat> if A were just sending out triggers, <coughs> we could use the self address message. Okay? This preserves D's authority quite nicely. Okay? Um, C's and Q's are protected from A, which is a beautiful thing. A only tracks messages. You no longer have to write code for this and Qer goes with this. This is this is the subscriber's and Qer. This is the data that the subscriber wants. You don't have to play those games. Um, A and C remain independent. A knows it's sending data somewhere, but doesn't know where and to whom. And of course, C does not depend on A's library in any way. Um, no extra abstract messages. Now, of course. Publishers, or publishers of just triggers are kind of rare because people want to send some data. And we would love to have that kind of, you know, pull that kind of trick with the self address message. I'm running out of time. Um, run that trick with the self address message, but do it with data. So I have been experimenting with, with some success and want to share with you the idea of an actor proxy. Okay? We're going to take that proxy idea of the self address message and we're going to push it a little bit. So our publisher is going to come with as part of its API, a subscriber proxy class, which has one or more methods that um, are just, you know, send some data somewhere, whatever the data type has to be. Um, somebody, some entity is going to provide for every subscriber, in this case nested A, a child of that subscriber proxy that implements those methods. The implementation is a send data method, just invoke a message of the subscriber just like we're doing the self address message. Okay? Um, the publisher, when it publishes data, all it has is a list of subscriptions. No idea where the stuff is going, just data that it has to push. And so it gets its data and it parses it out and sends it where it needs to go. We preserve all of those benefits for the self address message in terms of the publisher and the subscriber. And we can push on this a little bit. So you can make as many as you need. And of course, your subscribers don't even know they're subscribers. They're just actors in your system. Um, <clears throat> you can make as many of them as you need. If the APIs don't quite line up, that's OK. You can put a little bridge code in there. I can take that waveform and pull the array of doubles out of it. We pass that to an actor that only wants an array of doubles. Um, hey, don't want to subscribe to a particular part of the data set? Don't provide the override. And of course, it doesn't have to be an actor that you're sending it to. It can be part of your simulation class, which is really, really nice for something that I was hoping, if I had a few more minutes, I would go into talking about the beautiful thing of all of this decoupling for being able to put an actor in a harness and test it independently. And these um, actor proxies are great for that when you have to go outside your normal tree. So I'm just about out of time. Um, so I'll blaze through this and talk about decluttering actors and some suggestions for lighter weight zero coupling. These are suggestions. Try them if you like them. I've been experimenting with them. Um, they seem to work pretty well for me. Um, I might get a earful about it in a few minutes. I don't know. Um, oh, Steve's like that. That makes me happy. Uh, so that's it. Um, I'll take questions in like the two minutes I have left. And then, of course, I'm around to need to catch me online. And here's the ways you can get hold of me uh, outside of, of this venue. So questions? Oh, that's a bad, okay, I gotta remember I'm in Europe.
in America, people ask questions to demonstrate their own. So, <laughs> never remember them in Europe, but no questions is okay. <laughs> um, no questions? All right, cool. Well, if you have questions, find me afterwards. I'll be around. Um, I'm here in Yeah. <laughs> uh, since I'm in the US, I guess I have a question. Okay. <laughs> no, but uh, is there an easy way that, so one of the main things that they're always have to do is they launch actors, and I'm, I'm always trying to get the actual reference. You want to create like a hierarchy of views. It's always like you know, launching and then right. hosting that other actor that you just launched. Oh, instead of a instead of a sub panel, uh, talk to me about that. But you can use a proxy for that, and it's actually a really good idea. Um, what was your specific question? I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if there's a like, I always thought, well, why couldn't you just just like you get the queue out? Why couldn't you get the actor or BI reference out of the launch actor? Because if I hand you my if I hand you my yeah, reference, I, I put a gun to my head and put your hand on it. It's, it. It breaks a lot of encapsulation. Now, when we talk to you offline, you can make a proxy. Actually, what you can just make a proxy for that reference and you can pass that up, and that's a lot safer. Let me talk to you about it. Okay. okay. Passing back to references around is dangerous. Uh, yeah, references around is dangerous. Um, because you can do horrible things. Uh, but like UI help a dude like by like overriding at the core or creating your own UI. I, <coughs> I tend to create a top class that everything inherits from, which is just a stock user event. Okay, yeah, we've, we've talked about making we've talked about making the UI generating experience better. I have some ideas I haven't just person. Uh, is that is that not advisable to have you know, a stock user, global stock user event. Uh, if you wanted to define a set of events that were common to a lot of your UI actors, that, that would be a way to do it, that's fine. Though the question was, could he, could he make a, a parent actor for his UIs that implemented his, his stock behavior for public use? And the answer is yes, that would be, that would be fine. Um, and, and I will talk to you about uh, wrapping that, that up in a proxy so you can save yourself some trouble later. Because it is a reasonable thing to find. I know why you wouldn't do it. It's a good thing to do, but you gotta protect yourself.